Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Lindsay Salisbury. Uh, I'm from Facebook. I'm on the containers team. I'm going to talk today about building portable service um, slash container images with Buck. Uh, I want to cover a couple of things um, through this talk. We'll talk a little bit about what Buck is, um, uh, how it's set up, how it works. Uh, what are the goals of the project that we have for building container images with Buck uh, and portable services with Buck? Uh, what the basic components are, uh, how all the pieces under the covers work. Um, I'll do a very risky live demo. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the future, sort of where we're going with this project and, uh, and how this is going to play out uh, over the next few months and years. So first, we'll talk about Buck. It's got a cool name. Um, this is from the Buck website. Um, it, the point is to add reproducibility. Um, Buck will only use the declared inputs, uh, which means everybody gets the same results. This is basically uh, uh, trying to build a, a reproducible and hermetic build system. Um, you can go read more about Buck on the website. Um, these points that I'm pointing out are important for us for container images. That's why I'm bringing them up. Uh, get, so you, we need to be able to get correct incremental builds. So if parts of the build change, we want to be able to um, use those uh, incremental build parts, and they should always be correct, and you shouldn't have to rebuild the entire thing from scratch. So you can sort of compose things uh, as subparts of the system change. And uh, very importantly, we want to be able to understand your dependencies. Um, with Buck Query, you can basically like walk through all the, the, the things that your build depends on. You can do reverse dependencies to find out what things depend on you. Uh, and it, this is pretty uh, important and useful for figuring out and sort of like debugging um, where parts of your build or your container image come from. So Buck uses Skylark uh, from Basil, Basil, I believe Basil, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, I think the new one is Starlark. They've changed the name. Um, we're still using Skylark, which is a slightly older version of that, but it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, Skylark is a... Uh, uh, domain-specific language that's um, non-Turing complete. It allows you to sort of, it has, um, a, it's like a subset of Python that allows you to build, um, sort of build config things. I'll show a little bit of that in the demos and throughout the talk. Uh, it supports C++, Go, Rust, Haskell, um, D, Shell, and now container images. So what are the goals of the uh, Buck image build uh, project? Well. We want to be able to build primitives necessary to support hermetic builds and progress towards reproducible builds, not just in um, binaries or comp compilation aspects or the compilation artifacts, but also container artifacts and images themselves. So being able to reproduce them when you, uh, when you rebuild from a particular git hash or hg hash and actually having uh, full hermetic builds, which means that your build environment doesn't affect the output of the, the build itself. Um, the file system construction language is declarative, so it means that the compiler will check uh, for file system actions for compatibility. Uh, it'll sort them automatically. It'll figure out what the dependencies are. You don't have to um, imperatively understand how the file system is going to get constructed in order to uh, reproduce or, or sort of build a file system um, in a sane way. And it is strict. Uh, to the extent possible, we'll enforce that actions fully succeed, and we don't add features that don't compose predictably with others. So th this is sort of an important aspect of it um, because there are lots of uh, gotchas when you're start constructing file systems. Um, one of the things that we don't do uh, is we don't allow arbitrary command execution. So there was a talk of yesterday about um, uh, Bazel and, and, um, and their lack of that as well. Uh, we also don't really allow um, arbitrary command execution because you can't basically enforce what's going to happen to the file system in that case. Um, the nice part about Buck and Bazel actually is that there's this thing called a gen rule, which is where you can essentially write bash to generate um, uh, build, uh, build steps and build targets that are sort of pseudo reproducible. Uh, and that helps sort of mitigate some of the complications with that as, it, as, um, as people start using this stuff. So one important part is that we want a deployable container to feel like a regular bar build artifact. Uh, as we move forward, and as we're deploying lots of services across all of our infrastructure, uh, the thing that we find is that users and customers of this don't really care of the fact that it's a container image. They just want their service to run. They want all their dependencies wrapped up. They want to push everything out into their, into their production environment. 
And what they want to worry about is sort of managing and operating their service, not necessarily like all the subcomponents that are required to go into that thing. So the more we can treat a container as a build artifact, the more we can leverage the existing understanding and knowledge and sort of um, uh, behaviors of the typical, build, the typical build chain. So things like co continuous build, CI, CD, um, testing, that kind of stuff, uh, we, we can sort of wrap, roll into this and, and get a lot of benefit from that. Ultimately, what you test is what you run. So when you run a test or you build a unit test or an integration test against your container, it is actually what you, it's running, it's testing against the thing you're gonna actually run in production. Um, that's a, a, a big goal for us. So what are the components of this build system? Um, so we build using a local ButterFS subvolume. Um, this whole thing is built around uh, using ButterFS locally to construct the file system. Uh, part of the code of this is we actually uh, built a ButterFS send stream verifier. So we have a bunch of unit tests that actually parse and understand the, the, in, the extent structure of the send stream itself. Um, and the benefit of this is we found a couple of bugs in the send stream structure and like in the kernel actually using this, this mechanism to actually validate the send stream. Uh, what it means, though, is that we can build a container file system, dump the send stream of that file system, and then run it through this verifier and actually verify that the, that the send stream actions that are being performed are correct based on the build uh, input that we have. Um, we use systemd nspawn for isolation. I couldn't find the systemd logo. I was running out of time for my presentation, so I, um, that'll have to do. Uh, nspawn is the thing we use to build, uh, to run everything, um, in, uh, to, to build the, the image itself. Um, we, we use private networking, we turn off networking and make sure that nothing can talk to anything else. Uh, we, we use it for all the, the bind mounting and uh, read-only bind mounts and protecting certain mounts during the build. Um, the compiler is written in Python, uh, Python 3. Uh, it's, we have a strict test with 100% coverage. Uh, so one of the goals of the project is that we will always have 100% coverage on the code, on the code base. Um, and this is important for us because we want to make sure that we're actually testing the compiler itself uh, pretty strictly. It's also dependency free. We have no third party dependencies outside of Python standard library. Um, another interesting aspect of this is we actually also don't rely on the systemd on the hosts to, the, to do the build. So. Uh, we, we can essentially build this in a pretty constrained environment without having a full working DBus and everything else to, um, to, to, to talk to systemd and spawn. Um, so the Skylark is used for the buck target definitions. Um, and as I mentioned previously, it's pretty highly extensible via the general uh, and built-in buck primitives that allow you to sort of extend this thing. Uh, the cool part is, as, you, as we start playing with this, we start being able to add a whole bunch of additional features on top of the basic feature primitives, the image feature primitives, which I'll walk through here in a second. Um, and it allows us to build sort of more complex behavior uh, using all this, the smaller building blocks and, and uh, end up with sort of an, an abstraction in a general uh, in Buck that gives us some, some uh, uh, sort of pseudo API that users can use to do certain things like enable a systemd unit inside of an image during a build. Okay, so this is the actual Skylark uh, parts. I'm gonna walk through these. Uh, th we have a thing called image features. So all of the various file system operations that can occur on a, uh, inside of an image are wrapped up in what are called features. There's a bunch of different, um, bunch of different options you can do for features. I'm gonna walk through a few of them in this talk. Uh, one is obvious, uh, is something you need is a make dirs. Um, this gives us the ability to make directories inside the file system. Uh, we have a couple of different structures that we use inside the, the syntax. One, you can do a, a, a sort of a tuple um, shorthand, which is the directory you want to create inside, and the, the directory you want to create the new one in, and the directory you want to create. And then we have a more expanded uh, options where you can specify uh, uh, modes and users and owners and things like that. So as uh, um, referencing back to the fact that you need to know and the, um, that this is a declarative system and it needs to know all of the input components. The interesting thing about make is that you can't have something dropped into a directory that doesn't exist yet. So the compiler has to be told explicitly which directories you want to create. So you, you, it doesn't do make dir minus p essentially. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is because we can't derive the mode of the subdirectories that are necessary for that whole tree. You have to tell us. Um, 
Another one is symlinks. Um, so you can create symlinks in the file system. Uh, this is uh, creating a symlink to enable a multi-user target, uh, a service inside a multi-user target. There's two modes of symlinks, files and directories. Uh, the reason that they're different is because semantically uh, on the file system, they're actually treated slightly differently. And so we needed to, uh, the stat uh, properties are slightly different. So we needed to actually have two different uh, top, level, um, top level attributes. Another one is executable. So this is the sort of the more functional part of how things get rolled up into uh, into container images with Buck, because this is essentially uh, saying the colon my service binary means go find the target in Buck named my service binary, grab the output of that and put it at user bin my service. So this is where the dependency of the binary that the service owner might be building or whoever's building it um, lives. And this tells it how to install it into the, into the file system. Again, the paths need to exist. Um, so if the user libexec, for example, doesn't exist yet in the file system, the compiler will fail. Uh, it, will, it will fail on build, and you have to make sure that you have user libexec um, created. And another one uh, is uh, mounts. So mount points are really um, interesting, sometimes important, and sometimes not important and terrible. But, um, we, we need to be able to support the ability to do two basic things. One is sometimes we have to mount stuff from a host into a container. That's not always a great idea. Um, uh, we, like to, we're, we're, we like isolation. If we can isolate the host entirely from the container, that's the best model. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. And so uh, sometimes we need to be able to mount from the host into the container somewhere. So this is specifying, please mount Etsy from host into a directory called host mount slash Etsy. Uh, and again, the directory needs to exist uh, in the compiler. The second one is a little bit more interesting because what, the, what it says is basically take the layer target, the image layer target, which I'll get to in a second, and mount it in the container at service slash compose dash v1. So this gives us a mechanism to start building um, file systems, uh, different layers uh, that can basically be composed together inside of other layers through this declarative structure. Uh, and we also support RPM packages. Um, right now, we just, it's all RPMs, but we do have aspirations to support other packaging models as well. Um, we use RPMs internally, so that's what we focused on. But this basically uh, allows us to specify a set of RPMs that should also be installed inside the image. Um, now, the interesting thing is RPMs contain directories. Uh, they contain other things that are sub, like it, it, it might put stuff into a directory that doesn't yet exist in the file system. Uh, what the compiler will do is inspect the RPM and see what the paths are and, and what all the stat options are from the RPM and then add those to the, uh, to the, 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 the declarative structure of the, of the image. Okay, so features are the various individual actions that need to be performed on the file system and a layer is the thing that actually composes all the features together to create a, ultimately what's under the covers of ButterFS subvolume. And it's essentially just a list of all the features that you want to compose together. So we put all the features we just defined, uh, the make the sim links, the mounts, packages. And then we have another one in here that we added in line that's not sort of a standalone thing because it's just something that's specific to this layer. And that's where we're going to copy a file from the target default config, which is just like an export file or something that's, that lives in the, in the, uh, in the, um, the source tree. And we're going to put it at Etsy config D00 uh, default. Um, this obviously won't compile because I didn't create all the directories, but... Um, and the other part of, of this is this um, build ops, which uh, gives us this option for a build appliance. So the concept of a build appliance is that we can essentially have... Uh, it's sort of like, um, like repo root or uh, there's others like... Um, I'm trying to remember the names of them, but... Uh, where you can basically have a true environment that you build and run your... Your, uh, your file system construction. And so this is essentially like running nspawn instead of nspawn in order to build the file system that we're ultimately after. Uh, and it just gives us another extra layer of protection because the build appliance is a known entity and we know exactly what it looks like and we can reconstruct it um, and, and, and guarantee that the file system being constructed is running inside that uh, unknown, uh, known context. So you can also have a derived layer, which is a... Uh, a layer that's built on top of another layer. So here's a child layer built on top of the previous layer just defined. And it adds an additional image feature, which is a custom config that adds 
you know, 10, uh, 10 dash custom, which is some, you know, uh, special override specific to this layer. Uh, and this has a build option where we say we want the subvolume name to be uh, child layer instead of the default, which is just volume. Uh, and then we have a couple other special layers. Um, one of them is called a send stream layer, and this is essentially reconstructing a layer, uh, a ButterFS subvolume from an existing send stream that was already built. So the main purpose behind this is being able to have layers, have images that are being built, they're tested, they're validated, then they're, they're basically packaged and saved somewhere as a send stream, and then later on, uh, something else can reference the version of that layer or that image that has been tested and validated. So it's essentially like uh, having a stable version of some, some artifact that you're going to build against, and you don't have to always build against master. Sometimes master is broken. So uh, the interesting thing is the layers are the build targets. The features themselves aren't really build targets. They're just sort of in inputs that go into building the actual layer. In the buck system, you will actually build the layer itself. So you do a buck build and then the path to the, whatever that, that layer target is. Um, OK, so after we have a layer, now this is the thing that's built inside of, a, inside of your working environment. It's not really useful for you yet. You need to sort of export it and, and put it into a format that you can ship around. And that's what image package does. An image package supports, right now we support um, send streams, uh, ButterFS loopback image files, and SquashFS uh, outputs. And so what this does is takes the uh, subvolume that's contained inside the, uh, inside the, uh, the, the build environment and exports it as whatever this format is. So send stream, send stream ZST, uh, you can see. I'm in a hurry because I only have five minutes left and I wanted to show some actual code. Uh, so packages um, are just basically a layer exported format. Um, you can see this is sort of just a demo uh, or a uh, command line of what that would look like. Um, so buck run is an interesting aspect of this. Buck gives you the ability to actually run executables inside of that environment. What, what we can do with our image environment is give people an interactive sandbox. So we buck run, we add a special dash container um, endpoint to, the, to a layer target, and it gives us a shell inside of that container uh, in the build environment that we can sort of play with, inspect, inv uh, validate, sort of run commands, see what's going on in there. Um, if you have a special flag called enable boot target on your layer, we will actually boot the, the image with nspawn dash dash boot, um, or the equivalent thereof, that will actually spin up systemd inside of that container, which we run in, in our environment, and then uh, give you a full uh, sort of systemd container in, uh, uh, instance that you can play with and test and validate and sort of like mess around with. These interactive sandboxes are done in snapshots, um, uh, ephemeral subvolumes, and so whatever you do in this interactive snapshot gets lost when you leave, which doesn't break the hermeticity or the reproducibility of the image build. Okay, buck test is uh, built on top of buck run. What it does is allow us to build unit tests that actually run against the image itself. So we can run uh, tests inside the, uh, the true environment or inside the container environment. We can run them as nobody. We can run them as root. We can run them in booted mode. So we can actually write unit tests and integration tests against um, system D's containers to make sure that services spin up, to make sure that mounts work, sockets work that uh, it, you know, sort of all the variations of, of spin up, shut down, exit, exiting of services, um, all, all sorts of unit tests that people need to write for their container environments. OK, so let me see if I can make a demo work here. So uh, I have, I'm going to walk into really quick this uh, booted environment, which is a, an image that um, we use called SlimOS, which is just a stripped down version of uh, CentOS. Um, and what we have in here, if I go and look, is basically this, um, you know, the system D is running. Uh, I have access to all the services that are there. I can exit out of that, and you can see that that temp volume actually gets, uh, ends up getting, getting destroyed. Um, let me show you some of the actual, can you guys read that at all? The purple is great. So this is sort of like what a general looks like for fetching a pre-built image. Um, it's, it's basically just a bash script that like copies from somewhere. Um, we, we have some stuff we're working on that uh, will basically in, ensure that there's a hash. So if you download it from a remote location, it'll val validate and verify the hash um, to make sure that you can't just like install whatever from wherever. 
Uh, and then you create a send stream layer uh, from that actual, the output of that general. Um, and then you can build an image layer on top of that that does more stuff. Uh, you can install, uh, you've got a feature here that installs a file in uh, user lib systemd system for this service called meow, which is just a Python binary that will um, meow at you. Uh, and then this install executable, which is referencing this other, um, this other uh, uh, buck target, which is the actual Python binary itself. So you can see how we can compose the, the binaries or the, uh, the targets from the binary into the uh, file system. And if I build this, it will build the file system and it's going to download the send stream, it's going to unpack it, it's going to put it into a sub volume. And while that's running, um, I think I'm pretty close to out of time, so I'll go ahead and start taking, taking some questions, if there are any. That's pretty much, I can show more demos if you want, but. Sure, any questions? Okay, yeah, I guess. It's like, I, have to, I have to end my talk awkwardly, it's the story of my life. Yeah. Sure, I can repeat it too. Um, you, sh you showed us that you could test your uh, image. I didn't see where you had put any kind of assertions in there. Um, so I can show you some uh, one quick test uh, that I have here on this demo, which is um, sort of a, a pretty contrived example. But basically, I just want to validate that this thing is running as a particular user. Um, so I run who am I inside of that container, uh, and then I can check for to see, make sure that it's nobody. Um, How's that hooked up to the buck thing itself? Because this is just a unit test. Uh, so in the buck target itself, it's just a unit test, but with this special Python unit test yeah. image, right? So this is all the magic where it compiles the unit test and spins up the layer and then actually puts the unit test inside the layer and then invokes nspawn to execute the test inside of that container. Okay. So you, you mentioned RPMs, and I have two questions about mm -hmm. uh, that. So uh, how do you deal with scriptlets, for example, post-installation scriptlets in RPMs? Uh, we, don't, when we just don't run them. You don't run them? Yeah. So then Turing, that, that means that some RPMs will be just broken. Yeah, so there are some cases when, when the RPM installation is not quite what we were expecting, but there's not a lot we can do. I mean, in, in terms of the scriptlets, we have to sort of uh, ensure that when the RPM gets installed, it doesn't change stuff. One, one thing we're going to try and do to address that is actually that build appliance concept is where we can essentially build a layer that we can reuse. So we just build it once and the scriptlets run once and then we don't rerun them um, because we use a, basically a memoized version of the install. That makes sense. Uh, and uh, can you specify versions of the RPMs? Uh, so, so that's a part that um, I actually... I guess I shouldn't have ended my talk so, so early. Um, I actually had uh, to talk about, which is um, we have a mechanism for snapshotting all the repositories. And so the versions that you get when you install the RPMs are actually whatever the current version is in the repo snapshot. And the reason for the repo snapshot is that you then you have a hermetic build and it's reproducible at that particular point in time. So we re-snapshot the repo and then we'll put those hashes into the, the version control system. And then if you rebuild from that hash, you always get the same version of the RPM. So to advance that, you have to update the metadata about the, the, the snapshot. And that's part of what's coming in open source uh, as we make this a top level project and we keep um, uh, sort of pushing more of these changes into the, into the open source. Hey, um, I guess that's also covered my question on this slide, but uh, how do you handle dynamic libraries and uh, references to libraries that you also need to, while running stuff? Uh, so so the, most of what we're doing here um, in the install executable, especially in our environment, we, we do pretty static, um, static compilations, so we don't have a lot of um, shared libraries to build uh, or to copy in with our particular binaries. Um, one thing we're working on is an actual uh, LDD feature support, which is essentially where we'll trace the, the shared objects that are loaded um, and that are linked against that binary and put them in as well. 
Um, and that's something that we're working on to actually do more than just the, the buck, target, uh, buck target installation, but also take source layers that are already existing and sort of like extract the things that we care about. If you know how the make it CPIO works for like Arch and some other distros, where it'll just like, you take, give it a binary and it will walk the DL or the LD Yeah, tree. we do that. Yeah. As well, and XOS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, it's, we can basically build this, a very similar thing with the general stuff and like on top of the existing uh, target structure. Any other questions? Okay. He's telling me we're done, so. Cool. Thanks.